If you're ready, um, get your app ready and uh, get your phones and everything you need. John 15 says, greater love no one than this. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Two powerful texts that I hope to bring together in a way that will impart something in your spirit that will bless you as you go the rest of this day in this coming week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your kindness. We appreciate you for all that you are. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, we appreciate you for all that you are, God, and all that you are doing and all that you are giving unto us, oh, God. We ask, oh, God, that you be in this place in the name of Jesus, that you be in this place, oh, God, and bless us, Lord. Give us a word that would impact the heart of your people. Give us a word that will penetrate the heart of your people. Give us a word that will bring your people out of the muddy clay and deliver them for whatever challenges that they may be going through, whatever they may be dealing with, oh God, whatever they may be facing. We're asking you, oh God, oh God, to be involved in the name of Jesus. We're looking for your spirit to come down, oh God. We're looking for your spirit, oh God, to speak life where the enemy's trying to bring death. We look for your spirit to speak victory where we feel that we're defeated. We're looking for your spirit to speak encouragement when we feel like we're in despair. So we ask in the next few moments, oh God, that you bless our soul and give us something that will encourage us to stay with Jesus. And we're going to forever give you the praise, forever give you the glory in Jesus' name. Somebody say, thank God. Amen, amen, amen. We are so thankful for what God is doing. If you're in your house, you may be seated now and enjoy what God has for us on today. A powerful word we have for you on today, and it really starts in the Old Testament, where during this week, even today, the Jews still practice this, but up until Jesus, it was a, a custom that they would celebrate the Passover. Uh, the Passover, if you don't know what it is, is exactly what it says, is that something would pass over you. Well, there was a time where the, the, the people of God was in Egypt and they were bound and God was going to deliver them. And God worked nine miracles and wonders that ultimately did not change the heart of Pharaoh to let his God's people go. So the last miracle and wonder God works is one where he decides that he's going to kill all the firstborn of the land. Why? Because the firstborn and the first of everything, here's an extra bonus today, has always been and always will be dedicated unto the Lord. That means your first child is dedicated, belongs to the Lord. Your first paycheck at your new job ought to be given to the Lord. Your, your first, when you get married, that first day ought to belong to the Lord. Everything that is first belongs and should be dedicated to the Lord. And so God told his people that I want you to find a lamb without spot or blemish, and I'm going to paraphrase this, uh, and I want you to kill that lamb and take the blood of that lamb and post it over the blood, uh, over the post of your door, so that when the death angel comes in to kill all the firstborn of the land, it will pass over your house and won't kill your firstborn, because when it sees the blood, the blood will be sufficient to allow death not to come to them. Well, since that time on, they practice this as a memorial to never forget what God did in their life. And while I don't have a lamb here because I don't want nobody to come arrest me or uh, say anything crazy about me sacrificing a lamb online, what I do have is an example real quick of what would happen every year. Brothers, y'all come help me out real quick. Every year and often throughout the year, they would cut 
at the lamb, like I'm doing with this watermelon, and they would take the blood and make sure that the blood was draining. And as the blood drained into the bowl that they would have, they would then take the blood. They would then take the blood, and they, by, for symbolism, they would take it upon a piece of material and begin to put the blood all on the material as representation of the blood purifying and atoning for the sins of the world and of the fellow people of God. So they would take this blood and they would wipe it and they would pan it all over as representation that sins God was forgiving or covering up their sins. And so what's so powerful is that this was done every year during this fest during this feast. And not only that, it was done multiple other times, but the emphasis was is that there had to be a sacrifice that had to be blood shed. They would take an innocent animal and shed its blood and begin to put its blood upon a material to represent that the blood is covering up the sins of the people because something had to die in order to pay for the penalty of sin. Thank you, Jesus. So this blood is somewhat like what y'all doing right now because of the corona. It's like hand sanitizer. I saw spray designed to disinfect or to kill the germs, which sin is like germs in our life. That's what this is an example of. The one challenge, though, is that if you notice something here, I read through every one of these materials that all y'all use and are very confident in. But I notice each one of them all say something. They all say they're supposed to get rid of germs and they're supposed to kill things. But they all say something on there that says kills 99.99% of germs. Oh, I'm preaching right now. Y'all ain't even heard it. Each one of these kill 99.99% of the germs which means there is still a probability that no matter how much you wipe things down, no matter how much you try to protect yourself from getting sick, there's still a probability high enough that you would get sick anyways, even though you took all the necessary precautions. None of these have a guarantee on them. Oh, Jesus, I'm preaching right now. None of them have a guarantee on them. And that's why many of y'all throughout the year get a cold anyways. Even though you wipe stuff down, and some of y'all gonna wipe like never before after we get through this season. But even though you hand sanitize and wash your hands and you do all the right things, you still get sick and some of you still get the flu and you, because what all these understand is that there's no guarantee. And the reality of it is, is that the lambs, even though they were sacrificial, they were not a guarantee to wash our sins away, which is why they had to sacrifice every single year because one lamb was not sufficient to wash away all your sins. One lamb was only good enough to cover your sins for a year. But if you sin at any point after they completed the washing of those uh, uh, completed the sacrifice of those lambs, then you would have to come all the way back again multiple times to have your sin forgiven again. All right, brothers, I'm ready. So the reality of it is, is that this is the example of what was taking place this week with Jesus. We sinned, and because of our sin, there had to be a sacrifice. And I want to talk about the reason I'm staying with Jesus today is because he loves me so great. Yeah, yeah, because, because he was that sacrifice. If I can give you the cliff notes real quick of my message, he was the sacrifice that died for me. Because while I'm talking about animals and hand sanitizer and Lysol, it's already horrible enough to imagine an animal having to die for you. An innocent animal that doesn't know anything about what's going on, has no clue that it's getting ready to die for you, 
being killed. But Jesus, a man conscious of what he was getting ready to do to die for you, I can end my message right now to say his love was too great. And that's why I'm staying with Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so this, this understanding and revelation of this week and what this day represent is so much more than us taking it for granted. It's not about Easter eggs. It's not about having a packed house, which every, every pastor on Resurrection Sunday is counting on it to be one of the biggest packed houses that they ever had. If you've ever seen any of those clips online about how service looks on Resurrection Sunday and then how it looks the next Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, they got spike lights, they got announcers, they got everything, they got people coming from the sky, they got people doing backflips and twirls and all kind of stuff. It looks so great, but then the next Sunday they go back to regular church. Because for years, the church has counted on Resurrection Sunday to be the game changer for their church, whether it's attendance, whether it's finances, whether it's momentum. But now, nobody's in the church this Resurrection Sunday. Woo! Ah, oh, and everybody is at home. And this would be a good reason for us to just stay at home and not think about Jesus. This would be a good reason for us to forget about Jesus because all the traditional stuff we normally do, you can't do today. Yeah, kids can't go Easter and hug, hunting with all their friends because we got to have six feet distance. Uh, yeah, y'all know it's social distancing. Uh, so you can do a few at home, but, but, but my point to you is, is that there's many reasons that the traditions have bunked, been bunked, uh, uh, debunked and been thrown out the window, but I'm challenging us to stay with Jesus. Yeah, I'm challenging you to stay with Jesus because his love is too great. Oh, you don't believe me? Let me prove to you that his love was so great. Um, the first thing that I noticed about Jesus is that I know, the reason why I know his love is so great is because he suffered for me and you. Somebody say he suffered for me and you. Yeah. Oh, you don't believe me? Let's read Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5, and I need you to shout when it hits your spirit. He was looked down on and passed over. A man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. Oh, Jesus. One look at him and people turned away. Ooh, you so rough that people can't stand to look at you. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Uh, we looked down on him and thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pangs he carried. Ooh, it was our disfigurements. Uh, all the things wrong with us. Ooh. We thought he brought it on himself that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him. Oh, I need you to understand that. It was our sins that caused his suffering. It was our sins that brought about him being whipped. It was our sins that brought about his pain. It was our sins that made Jesus look like a fool. Yeah, yeah, on Good Friday, Jesus looked like a fool to his disciples and everybody else. Because for three years, he was working miracles and talking about who I am and how big and bad I am. And he wasn't afraid of nobody. But here he is now being helplessly beaten. He looks like a fool. And is he looking like a fool for you? Have you ever been in a situation that you look crazy because somebody at your job didn't do their job and everybody thought it was you that didn't do your job? Oh, okay, can I get an amen? Yeah, can I get an amen online? Facebook, talk to me. Uh-huh, uh-huh, you two, holler at me. Woo, Jesus. It wasn't your fault, but people thought it was your fault. So you look foolish for somebody else's foolishness? Well, Jesus looked foolish for your foolishness. Think about the time you've been most foolish. He took the fall for that. Y'all not hearing me. So he suffered for us. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, he suffered for us. We thought he brought it upon himself, but it was uh, that God was punishing for his own failures, but it was our sins that did that to him. They ripped and tore and crushed him, our, our sins. Everybody say our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. 
Oh, y'all didn't, sh y'all didn't shout on that through his bruises. Oh, okay, maybe I need to go to King James Version. By his stripes, we are healed. Oh, did that help some of y'all out? By his stripes, we have been recovered. We've been made whole. Because the King James Version, y'all don't remember, y'all don't know the message version. The, me the King James Version says, for he was bruised for our iniquities. Okay, that helped y'all out. All right, all right, that'll get y'all closer. So by his stripes, we are healed. In other words, people, he took the bullet for you. Yeah, if you ever heard that phrase, that phrase did really deals with the reality that the person that was getting shot had no clue that they were about to be assassinated. Yeah, so they didn't have enough time to dodge. So what happens is you have security guards that will take the bullet for somebody they're trying to protect and move them out the way. You didn't have enough time to rectify your situation. You, the moment you sent, God the Father sent a bullet to kill you. And Jesus, knowing that he needed to make a split decision, jumped in and took the bullet for you. I'm staying with Jesus because I don't know too many people that's going to take a bullet for me. Woo! That ought to help some of y'all right now. Yeah, in other words, okay, maybe you don't like that one. What about he took the fall? You know, you know so when you're riding with a, a gang or whatever it may be, uh, they'll tell you that you don't know snitches get stitches. So if you get caught, you got to take the fall for us. Though you're innocent, you take the fall. Jesus took the fall for us, and he was innocent. Not only that, Jesus is okay with the fact that you threw him under the bus. I'm just trying to give you reasons to stay with Jesus. You threw him under the bus. You didn't add him. Um, God, it was the woman you gave me. Yeah, yeah, you, you try to blame God for why you have caused the wrecks in your life and the chaos in your life and the sins in your life. You try to blame God. God made me this way. And all your excuses didn't work with God, so Jesus get, got thrown under the bus, and he's the one that had to take it. So I'm staying with Jesus because he suffered for me and you. I'm staying with Jesus because he knew we didn't have a clue. Somebody said he knew we didn't have a clue. Yeah, yeah, he knew we really didn't know what was going on. Listen to this text, Luke 23, 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, let me be exegetical for a moment. We know contextually it's talking about the fact that the guards were rolling, shaking the dice, 7-Eleven. They was doing a little craps to divide uh, uh, Jesus' um, um, robe and divide his clothes. They said, he don't need this. Shake him up. Shake him up. Ten on. Ten to win. Ten to win. Ah, uh, there we go. There we go. Mary, baby, need a new pair of shoes. All right, okay, all right. Let me stay on it. Let me stay on it. Uh, 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 so, 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 so they were dividing his garments. How disrespectful it would be in that cultural setting for you to take the, something that belongs to somebody else. We already know how we feel, but it was highly disrespectful. And, and, and their disregard and in lack of sympathy or empathy for a man dying on the cross, regardless if they liked him or not, you would think naturally we would have some empathy, but there was none there. And Jesus could have got upset about it, but him being God in flesh said, Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Well, what does that got to do with us? Well, listen to this. Many of us are so wrapped up in our sinful natures that we have no clue what we've really done to ourselves, how we really disrespected God, how we really dishonored God, or how we've really not appreciated God and who he is. Uh, uh, many of us are so caught. You know what? This is how I know some of us are more worried about temporary things and less worried about God. Because some of y'all know more facts about COVID-19 than you do on scriptures. Oh, I just hit somebody right there. Some of y'all know more facts about coronavirus and how many people dying and what you do can protect, protect, to protect yourself. You know more about that than you know verses in the Bible. Oh, you, you don't have a clue what the main thing is. Because I need you to understand there's an appointed time for all men to die. And if it's your time, it's your time. And if you're going to spend more attention and give more attention to the temporary things, then God, something's wrong. I'll forgive them because they don't know what they do. 
He knew we didn't have a clue. He knew that our mind frame would be more focused on things that don't really matter in the big picture than things that really matter. Now, I'm not telling none of y'all to go out there and just go against the grain and start acting crazy. But what I'm trying to tell you is that how is it that you can spend more hours on CNN than you can in prayer? Woo, how come you can spend so much time fearful and not enough time faithful? Oh, y'all not hearing me this. I'm preaching right now. Why is it that you can give so, invest so much time into the things because of what the word you have heard people that you don't trust anyways telling you? But the word that you can trust on and rely in that says God's going to protect you and keep you, you not finding yourself opening up that book, dusting it off and finding yourself hiding yourself in it. Oh, I want to challenge you this morning. Let's stay with Jesus. Because his love is too great. I know we're going through some trying times. I know things are difficult. I know we're facing some things that we never thought we would have to face before. But I want to make sure that we, th we stay where Jesus wants us to be. Because I believe there is victory in the midst of everything we're going through. If you believe it, give God some praise. If you believe it, give God some glory. Yeah. I believe there's victory in the midst of what we're going through, in the midst of what we're dealing with, in the midst of what we may be facing. There's still yet victory, and I'm going to stay with Jesus because he knew I didn't have a clue. Yeah, yeah, he suffered for me and you. He knew we didn't have a clue. Leviticus 5.17 says, I don't care nothing about your ignorance. You know, somebody said that ignorance is bliss. They ain't never read the scripture. Because Leviticus 5.17 says, check this out. Let me read this text to you real quick. Uh, 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 when you stand on this word, it says, if anyone sins doing anything, any of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he don't know it, woo, then he realizes his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. In other words, the text is saying, even if you sin and you didn't know you were sinning, you still got to be held accountable. Uh, and the reality of it is some of us didn't know some things were sin until we learned who Jesus was. Ooh, I'm helping you right now. Uh, 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 that's why you got strongholds that you got in your life, because you didn't understand the impact of some of the decisions that you were making, some of the things you were entertaining, some of the parties that you went to that you got exposed to some things, some things that came up through your family that you thought it was just how people live. And then you got outside your family and realized this ain't godly, this, this ain't edifying to me. But if, it seemed like it made sense the way we did things and how we live. But, but when you got in Jesus, you realized that this was sin. Oh, I'm staying with Jesus because he realized I didn't have a clue that I was killing myself. I didn't have a clue that I was messing my life up. I didn't have a clue that there would be some things I'm going to have to spend years coming out of because the damage had already been done. Oh, Jesus, I thank you in this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm staying with Jesus. Ooh. I, oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm th I, hallelujah. Thank Somebody give God some praise in this place. I'm staying with Jesus because he suffered for me and you. I'm staying with Jesus because we really didn't have a clue. Oh, I'm staying with Jesus. Last one, because his, his love is too great to lose. His love is too great to lose. I, uh, his, I'm going to say it again. I need you to catch it. I, I, those of you that are on the fence about Jesus, those of you that really ain't been staying with Jesus, this last one ought to hit you because his love is just too great to lose. Jesus tells his disciples, no greater love is it than this, than a man that is willing to give his life for his friends. Plural. Woo. Oh. Now to hit somebody right there. Let me be exegetical for a moment. He said, no greater love. Oh, thank you, Jesus. No greater love. There's no greater love than you being willing to die for somebody is what he's saying. Now, now what's so crazy about the situation is, is that first of all, most of us, we love our friends, but we're not consciously going to die for them. Oh, y'all go. Oh, it's silent in here. Listen, y'all online, they silent in here too, just like you are. We love our friends, but, 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 but we're, 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 we're not going to die for them consciously. We may die for a friend if we know that they were a really good person. 
I'm trying to help. I'm trying to help y'all out. I don't know. Okay, that didn't work either. Uh, uh, or if we knew them were innocent. But here's the problem with Jesus' situation. Every friend he looked at was guilty. What hurt so bad is that every friend he looked at deserved to die. Woo! I'm helping y'all right now. Oh, you don't believe me? Adam deserved to die because he ate the fruit. Abraham deserved to die because he stopped believing God and had a child outside of his wife because he didn't trust God. David died because he had God-given power and he abused it to kill a man. Moses should have died because he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock, thus bringing glory to himself and not glory to God. Oh, Judah should have died because Judah walked in sin and didn't trust God. I, 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 can I keep going? Reuben should have died because he sinned against his own father. Simeon and Levi should have died because they killed innocent men. Woo. I can keep going. I can keep going. I can keep as innocent as Job was. He should have died because he started wanting to question and complaining against God. Y'all ain't heard me in here. Uh, even Mary, his, his own mother, should have died because she saw him born as a virgin by the Holy Spirit. But yet she brought her, bro her sons and daughters to try to stop Jesus' ministry. Y'all not hearing me today. Everybody he looked at was guilty. The 12 that walked with him was guilty. Every, when things got rough, they all deserted him because they feared man more than they feared God. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Oh, there's another person that was guilty. His name is Solomon Adair. Oh, yeah, yeah, because he has sinned so much that you can't count them all. Woo! Yeah, yeah, he didn't make so many mistakes that literally it ain't funny no more. And you are Jesus' friends. And Jesus looked at you, and he saw that you deserve to die. But his love is so great that he said, I will lay down my life for all my friends, for all my homies, for all my loved ones. Though every one of them are guilty, though every one of them desire death, though every one of them should be penalized, though every one of them should be let go. Every one of them should be destroyed. Every one of them should be put down. They ought to take their own bullet. They ought to take their own fall. But I'm going to lay my life down for my friends. Somebody praise God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No greater love that a man can show unless he's willing to give his life for his friends. Jesus says in the text when he's talking to Pontius Pilate in John, or when he's talking, actually he's further in the scripture, he tells him that no man takes my life. I lay down my life and I have power. Check this out. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up, which means even on the cross, he could have said, I don't want to go through. At any moment, Jesus, see, this is the great mystery about God, because God trusts himself enough that he gives himself freedom to make own, his own choice. Oh, y'all ain't caught that. That's a word right there. God trusts enough in himself that he can give himself enough freedom to make his own choice. What am I saying? God the Father trusted the Son enough that he still left the choice up to the Son on whether he would die. Oh, the scripture says, Jesus, thinking it not robbery, being equal to God, made himself of no reputation and made himself lower than the angels. So though the father said, you're going to have to go, the son had to say yes. Oh, I'm preaching this morning right now. That means from the beginning, from the Genesis, Jesus had said yes. And when he came on this earth, he was saying yes. And even in the garden, as tough as it got, because there's a difference between knowledge and experience. It's one thing to know something, but to experience something is very different. That's why God has emotions, because when he experiences your love, it moves him. Woo! So, so Jesus said, if it be, let this cup pass from me, because the flesh did not want to go through the suffering. Oh, it wasn't easy for him to go to this cross. We think it is as simple as the movie and the TV shows and just reading the scripture. 
but, 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 but I need you to understand that, that Jesus understood no one takes my life. I lay my life down, and I can take it back anytime I get ready to. Oh, but he hung on that cross. And instead of him taking his life, he was worried about others. Mary, here's your son, John, the, the, the apostle. John, the apostle, here's your mother. In other words, take care of each other. Uh, 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 I thirst. And then he, he said things. I thirst. He was worried more about that part, fulfilling scripture. Thief, this day you shall be with me in paradise. Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. I'm staying with Jesus because his love is too great to lose. I don't want to lose that kind of love. A person that would consciously love me enough to lay down his life and die for me when he looked at me before I was born and saw that I was sin and that by justice I should be paying for my sin. Ooh, Jesus. But that's the kind of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God gave him, but he had to go. And Jesus made a decision to go. And today represents the fact that he came out of the grave because he had enough power not just to come out of the grave, but to go to the grave. Oh, I need y'all to catch that. He had enough power to actually go to the grave. Woo! Because the hardest part for Jesus was going to the grave, not coming out of the grave. I know that sounds awkward, but the hardest thing for Jesus was to finish his course. Because once he finished his course, then the Father took over. Because the Bible says that the Father rose Jesus from the dead on the third day. He didn't raise himself. The Father did. Oh! I just want to encourage you that Jesus gave up his power and his divinity and his ability, and he left himself in the hand of the Father. I'm staying with Jesus because his love is too great to lose. Somebody give God some praise. Yeah, let us stand. So we need to understand this day and how powerful it is. Because what Jesus did on the cross was supernatural. He knew he was born to die. Yeah. He was born to die. Every day, literally, every day, he was closer to death. And some of us, we don't live that way like we live like we're going to be here forever, which is why we don't have staying power. We trust God sometimes. But when things get difficult, we do our own thing. But I'm challenging you in every, er every area of your life to stay with Jesus. In your marriage, stay with Jesus. As a parent, stay with Jesus. In your work environment, or if you don't have a job, stay with Jesus. Don't develop bad habits. Deliver yourself of that stinking thinking. Don't get mad at God because of what you're going through. But trust him. And if you are angry, have enough God in you to tell him that you're angry. Because God loves to have an honest conversation. If you are hurt, tell him you're hurt. Because God loves to have a real conversation. But whatever you do, stay with Jesus because his love is too great. While you are where you're listening, wherever you may be, I believe God wants to do something permanent in your life. So whether you have been fearful, whether you've walked away from God, stopped trusting him, or whether you don't know Jesus at all, I want to invite you to get on this side of eternity where no matter what you go through though you may still face trials and tribulations 
they're not the end of your story because the Jesus that I'm talking about looked at you and saw his friend and that his friend deserved to die but he also saw that his friend needed a savior Jesus. his friend needed a savior and he'll say he said to himself I'll save you I'll step in and save you from yourself and if that's you today and this word has spoken to your heart I want to pray with you that you may receive what God has for you in every way on today if you just bow your heads with me Heavenly Father